Good morning. That was a little weak. Good morning. Let's stand together as we begin our worship this morning with hymn number 405. Hymn 405, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Yeah. 
great to be in the house of the Lord. It's great to be with the church family gathered together this morning for worship, for praise, to open up the word of God, and also just to be together. Let's take a few minutes just to turn around, greet one another, reach out to a visitor, and just say good morning. Thank you for joining us for the worship service this morning at Caldwell First Baptist Church. We're so glad to have you as part of our First Baptist family. This morning's message will be brought by Dr. Mark Platt, preaching from Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. So open your Bible to that passage. We'll be studying God's word together in just a few minutes. We're so glad you've joined us to, to worship the Lord Jesus together. May God richly bless you. If you can begin returning to your seats and let's remain standing for our verse of the month.
Let's all repeat the, the reference and then the verse and then the reference. Micah 7, 18 to 19. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our inequities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Micah 7, 18 and 19. Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see you all here today. If I didn't make the rounds and get to shake your hand and say hello, I'll try to catch you later. Uh, we would like you to start the registration process, please. Tablets are on the outsides of the aisles. Tear off a sheet and pass it to the center, if you would. If you are visiting us for the very first time, we would very much like for you to stop by the Welcome Center, which is just through these doors in the lobby. We have a special gift for you. We'd like you to join us today at Mallard Park at 1 o'clock after the service for the all-church birthday party. It's also a potluck, so bring a main dish and a side dish to share. It starts at 1 o'clock at Mallard Park, and if you don't know where that is, that's a new park in Caldwell on 10th. You go past Highway 55 to Orchard, and it will be on your left. There will also be some musical entertainment there for your listening pleasure, so be sure to bring lawn chairs and your Frisbees. On September 23rd, uh, that would be Friday, we will have a special guest from First Fruits of Zion who will be doing a Sabbath evening meal and presentation at 6 p.m. He will also do a talk and a Sabbath day closing meal on the 24th from 2 to 6 p.m. The meals and refreshments will be provided for a cost, and seating is limited to 70 people, so please register by the 19th. Brochures are available at the Welcome Center. If you need more information about that, you can also contact Bob Thompson with questions. Meet new international students on October 2nd at Blazing Hope Ranch. We need cakes and salads for that event. Please sign up at the Welcome Center. Again, that's through these doors in the lobby. You may RSVP, or we ask you to RSVP by writing IF, that would be International Friends, on your registration. There is loads more information that we can't cover here in your bulletin, so please be sure you read that. Thanks very much. Well, we want to remember our missionaries of the week. Uh, the Hollies down in Nicaragua, I took a look at their newsletter, and let me tell you um, what challenges. They, they talk about being at the ends of the earth, and they may be, there's no mail service there, but we can have a letter sent to them at a, at a different address, and it will get to them eventually. But they were talking about building a, their church. They have property. They have made... 1,500 blocks to build the church. They've dug trenches, but now opposition has come upon them from some corrupt leaders there who's just said stop, and they're not sure how that's gonna work. Uh, if someone can raise their hand to send a letter to the Hollies. Uh, the exciting thing is, as they drive through the community, children come running out, and they started a Sunday school. It grew so fast, they've split it into two, their Sunday school isn't quite like ours. They hold it under a tree, but many of the parents are coming to Christ. They have three people in their Bible Institute, and as remote as it is, they go by boat down the river to some other villages, uh, sharing Christ, and they need a boat. That's one of their prayer requests. They need a boat of their own because it's expensive for them, so think about and pray for the Hollies. I also want to share a word for you, if we can also, uh, our other missionaries of the week, are our own Mel and Patty Davis. And I would asked Mel if he might uh, share a couple of things to, uh, for me to share with you. Uh, does someone want to share a letter to Mel and Patty? Just raise your hand and we'll get that out to you. Let me share this note that Mel sent me last night. Dear friends, it was so good to be with you last month. 
and update you a bit on what the Lord is doing in Slovenia. Right after our visit, Patty and I learned that I have prostate cancer. It is in the early stage. The doctor is very optimistic about treatment. This will, of course, delay our return to Slovenia, though we are hopeful we can return by mid-November. Thank you for your continued prayers for us <clears throat> and for our Slovene brothers and sisters. While this is certainly not what we expected or would have chosen, we know whom we have believed, and we're persuaded that he is able to guide and strengthen us through this new assignment, resting in him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we certainly come to you. We have great needs in our body. We have great needs for our missionaries that we want to lift up to you because, Father, their needs exceed anything that we can assist with. <clears throat> Father, we look to you as we raise up Mel and Patty Davis, and particularly, Lord, we ask you that you would give peace to the family, strengthen them. Lord, we ask that you would care for Mel and this, this need that his body has, and you would guide the doctors here. We're thankful he's home and that they can address this, and we look forward to great news about the outcome. But Lord, give him a great sense of supernatural peace as he goes through this process. Lord, we lift up the Hollies. We ask that you would protect his family in this challenging environment. We ask that you would bind the evil one who is using the corrupt leaders to thwart their efforts toward building a church. We ask that you would provide a boat for them that their outreach of the gospel would spread. And Lord, we rejoice in the children who come running, listening, coming to Christ, and their parents who follow. Lord, we want to lift up a couple of churches in our community, Eustique Nazarene just down the road, and also Riverside Baptist Church in Weezer. We ask, Lord, that today, that those fellowships would gather together in your name, hear your word, they would be strengthened, and that they would reach out in their areas of influence, and that you would bless that. Lord, we ask that um, also we need the elders to be strengthened and given wisdom as they continue to lead this body. We ask for the pulpit committee that you have uh, proposed that the body here would pray for them, consider them, and affirm them. And Lord, that you would lead as they begin to the search in this time of transition. We thank you for Mark Platt, who's here, for the wisdom he shared with the leaders this past couple of days and for his opening the word today. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. Fred and Candy and Bob are back from Cuba. We just are anxious to hear about what God, you did in their time there in Cuba. Lord, there are many in our body that are hurt and are sick and need you. Father, we ask that you would come for them. We ask that the body here would be sensitive and reach out to one another with a phone call or a word or a note to encourage one another. Lord, we have much to be thankful for, and today we want to bring our offerings to you. Lord, we are totally dependent upon you, and we thank you that we can gather freely to worship you, to hear your word, and to lift up our praise. In all of these things, Lord, we honor and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Mark Meyer. Um, I am, many of you that probably have never seen me before, have no idea why I'm here or who I am. I am Jenny Pinner's son uh, in town uh, for a family reunion, <clears throat> and I had called Pastor Shaw a few weeks ago to ask him if it would be okay for me to sing. Um, I'm from Alabama and don't get a chance to to uh, sing. My mother doesn't get a chance to hear me sing much, so I kind of it was a selfish reason to to, to call and to ask him if I could sing and he I didn't at that point I didn't realize that he was retiring and so <clears throat> and uh, he said well Mark I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be there in fact I really don't you know not really responsible for those for those services but I'm gonna go ahead and pencil you in <laughs> and I thought well you know what are they gonna do they're fire you you know so <laughs> so uh, so anyway I appreciate uh, Pastor Shaw giving me this opportunity and and then also with that in mind <clears throat> wanted to uh, think what I could sing that may be pertinent for this church. <clears throat> Sorry, this morning I woke up with a little bit of scratch, but 
and uh, and obviously a church that's in uh, you know some some transition, and uh, really just this song just kept coming back to me that this is a song I need to sing uh, for you today, <clears throat> mainly just because it's it's uh, called People Need the Lord, and obviously that is the the foundation of what the church is here all about. This church I know has always been very active in, in mission work, evident today, and uh, and uh, not only to the ends of the earth, but obviously here within the community. And so no matter where we're, uh, those people that we run into, everyone needs the Lord. So go ahead. <laughs> Every day they pass me by I can see it in their eyes Empty people filled with care Headed who knows where On they go through private pain Living fear to fear, laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. Broken dreams, he's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize? People. We are called to take his light To a world where wrong seems right What could be too great a cause for Sharing life with ones who's lost Through his love our hearts can feel All the grief they bear They must hear the words of life Only you can share People need the Lord People need the Lord At the end of broken dreams He's the open door the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that we must give our lives cause people need the Lord.
Mark, thank you very much. The last couple of days, we've had the privilege of having Dr. Mark Platt with us, meeting with the elders, meeting with some of the potential pulpit committee members, sharing from his vast amount of wisdom and experience. Mark is uh, part of the CB movement, particularly in the CB movement in the nor uh, Northern California area, working with the, that association for uh, a number of years. We won't use numbers specifically, but, uh, and then in his retirement, he is now part of a a group, the president of a group that works with churches like ours that are in transition. And so he came here to meet with us, some of our leaders, and share some of that with us. And now he is here to open up the Word of God. And Mark, we are just delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much. Would you help me do that? Good morning, everybody. We're going to raise the pulpit so I can see things. It's my honor to be with you this morning and to, uh, you know, this is, you really opened up something. Uh, my friend Daryl Larson and I have known each other since, well, the earth was still warm at that time. <laughs> my dad was his pastor in uh, Pasadena, California in the early 60s. And uh, he hasn't changed a bit. He does have a better haircut, however. And uh, I am so honored to uh, uh, be with you today. Your elders have been wonderful. Daryl uh, is going to take to the airport after church. Just uh, a great time with some very capable, godly leaders in your staff. And so thank you for inviting me. Inside your program, there's an outline. I want you to pull that out. It will help you stay awake. Somebody said, you know, when you preach, you don't need a, a watch, you need a calendar. So just watch. And, no, I'm just kidding. So inside your program is that outline. Would you pull it out and uh, open your Bibles to Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, right in the center of your Bible, and turn right a little bit. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Who, who in this room has memorized this? Okay. How many of it's your life first? Anybody in this room? Me too. Okay. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. When you found it, would you stand with me? And uh, guess what? We have the same Bible translation. If you read it off the screen with me, would you stand out of reverence to God's Word and read it with me in unison? Let's say it together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Wow, what great advice. Let's pray. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you that uh, you teach us and instruct us from your word. We invite the Holy Spirit to walk up and down the aisles. We ask him to talk to us about what this verse means, but more how it applies and how it applies to us and our relationship with you. So guide us and teach us and encourage us and instruct us and, and move us. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. There was a lawyer who was on his way home from work, and he stopped at uh, the local uh, supermarket. And as he walked up to the meat counter, the uh, butcher recognized him immediately. He said, uh, well, here's what the, boy, uh, the butcher said. He said, uh, you know, you're a lawyer. He said, uh, I've got a legal question for you. He said, uh, if you were me and uh, somebody, uh, somebody's dog was coming in the back door of this store and stealing meat, what would you do? Lawyer thought for a minute and he said, well, you know, he said, I, I'd find out who the dog's owner was and I'd send him a bill. Butcher says, uh, well, I'm glad you feel that way because uh, it's your dog and I figure it's about 100 bucks worth of meat. Lawyer smiled and he said, well, I'm glad you feel that way. He said, because uh, I just gave you $300 worth of legal advice, and so you can pay me the other $200 you owe me later. <laughs> Pretty good lawyer. Well, here's the question. Where do you go for good advice? Well, I read the newspaper, and in my newspaper, Miss Manners writes a column on etiquette. And if you want to know etiquette and uh, getting along with folks and uh, so on, you read Miss Manners. I think we found out Dr. Oz gives pretty good advice. Uh, he gave some to one of the political candidates this week. 
And uh, if you listen to Dr. Phil, you know, he uh, gives advice on personal problems. And then, of course, there's uh, Bob Brinker. I listen to him pretty much uh, all the time on Money Talk uh, on the ABC network. Uh, he gives you advice on money and uh, stocks and uh, getting ready for old age, which I guess, according to you, I'm already there. And uh, Actually, it's true. So uh, anyway, the bottom line is, if you go around the world and around Caldwell, Nevada, uh, Caldwell, Idaho, there's a, there's a event, Caldwell, Idaho, you'll probably only notice that uh, the business directory is filled with people who give advice for a living. There are certified public accountants, there are psychologists, there are, of course, lawyers. There's a whole new group called life coaches that give you advice. Uh, there are people who, in all areas, are what we call consultants. And today I found out that there are many people willing, willing to pay lots of money for good advice. So the question is, where can you advice that's good, that's godly, that's wise, that doesn't charge you a big uh, bundle of money, and if it's free, that's even better. Well, the answer is that um, in the book of Proverbs, there's a man named Solomon, and he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But as a person, as a part of his uh, uh, resume, you might say, that uh, the Bible calls him the wisest man that ever lived. When he became the king of Israel, God offered him anything he could have, and of all the things he was offered, he could have had money, he could have had power. Instead, he asked God for wisdom. And of course, that was the wisdom that opened up everything about it. Matter of fact, the Bible says that his wisdom was as measureless as the sands on the seashore. It says in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 34, that the men of the nations came to listen to his wisdom. And uh, the king sent these people. He was so wise that uh, the kings of the world, well, that's the person that God inspired to write the two little verses we just read and the two little verses we want to study this morning. Because if I could summarize it, the Bible has a solution to every aspect of your life. That if you were to take every decision, every problem, every circumstance, every marriage, if you were to take uh, your family and every child, if you were to go through all the major issues of your life that you need advice about, including money, the Bible has an answer to it. And here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God uses the wisest man that ever lived to give you some advice this morning. So what does God say about your life? What does God say about my life? And here's the question we want to answer this morning. Um, what is God's advice for me and for you? Well, this morning under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, looking at this passage, uh, I want to share with you five valuable pieces of advice that you need this morning. Five valuable pieces of, of advice that will help every young person, every middle-aged person. They are pieces of advice that will help you as you enter into old age. Five valuable pieces of advice. Well, if you're filling in the blanks this morning, remember my sermons sometimes all draw blanks, so there you are. Here goes. The first piece of advice is you need a personal faith. This means you can't have a faith that uh, someone else has. You can't uh, get it from your mom and dad. You have to take God into your life, and you have to let him run it. You trust in the Lord. This is the Hebrew word batach. Remember, the Bible or the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And uh, this word is used many times in the Old Testament, 109 times in the Old Testament, and it's translated to trust. It's actually a wrestling term. I spent some time with John Howard. He's been very, he's my host. And we've been talking about M, it's MMA, I think it is. Uh, well, this is a wrestling term, this word batak, and it speaks of the way that, uh, well, the way you win a wrestling match is you pin your opponent's uh, shoulders to the mat. And that's exactly what the word literally means, is you put all of your weight 
and you put all of your life and you put every aspect of your life on God. You rest. You trust. You put your life on God. Now, I, I know a little Hebrew. He runs a restaurant, uh, actually a, a clothing store down in San Jose where I live. But uh, actually, I do know a little Hebrew, and I want to give you just a little bit of parsing of what this word means. First thing I know about it is it's an understood subject. So you'll notice that there is no subject there. It doesn't say you, but you can tell by the verb tense that the word here is, uh, well, it's uh, second person uh, singular. So it's not said to a group of people. It's said to you personally must trust in the Lord. The second thing I notice about it is this word is uh, used in its second person singular. So it's something you have to do. It's understood, but it's it's second person singular. Third thing about it is it's an imperative. So this word is not an option. If you're going to become a Christian, if you're going to follow God, you have to. It is a must. You can't say, I'm going to take God uh, time uh, sometimes and not all the time, but it has to be a word. It's an imperative. This is the way that a person becomes a God follower, the way they become a Christian. It's an imperative verb. If I could put it into a nutshell, the word literally means that you, you can give me a click up there. Oh, it's uh, flying there. You must personally trust in the Lord. I'll give you some bullet points about this. The first thing I know is that you can't inherit faith. The person here who's writing this is King Solomon. He's the son of the man who's the man after God's own heart. He grew up in a wonderful, godly home. And yet he came to a point in his life, and that's where every one of us come, where we can't inherit our faith. Some people think that because their father or grandfather or somebody in their family was a minister or somebody was a good person who went to church all the time or they, they were born a Baptist or something, you know, that's foreign to the understanding of trusting in the Lord, that you have to personally make a decision. It is something you, singular, must do. You must trust in the Lord. And the concept here is it speaks very plainly about someone who has made a personal decision to let God run their life. You can't inherit faith. Uh, Daryl, a little update for you this morning, a couple of slides. Here's, here's a picture of my mom and dad. My dad, I grew up in a Christian home. I went to Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night. I made hospital calls with my dad. I've lived in the pastor's home for 67 years. I'm 67 years old, either as a pastor or a pastor's son. And uh, I grew up in this home where we read the Bible and prayed. It was a wonderful home. But I had to come to a point in my life where I gave my heart to Jesus where I said, God, I, I belong to you. I accept your salvation by grace through faith. And I made a personal decision to trust in the Lord. Now, unfortunately, I grew up in a family of three boys. And uh, the next click will tell you that uh, I'm the oldest. That's me on the left with hair. Actually, short hair back then, but with hair. And we're all named Bible names. I'm John Mark, and uh, my, my uh, middle brother there on the... Uh, right that would be, is Daniel, and uh, he died of advanced alcohol at the age of 56, far away from God, spent uh, several years in prison. My youngest brother David in the center, he just was convicted of a felony, far away from God. Now here's what I know. Am I any different than my brothers? No. Did I have any different upbringing than my parents? I have the same DNA. We had the same pastor. We had the same mom and dad. We had the same life experiences. Am I any better than my brothers? Absolutely not. Uh, my, my brother on the right, he was far smarter than I am. My brother in the middle was far richer than I used to be. Uh, it's remarkable how, uh, how, how much better they were. Why did my life turn out different? Because I made a personal decision to trust in the Lord. 
And you'll spot people in this church. I've met several in this church who will tell you that they came to a point in their life. I asked the search committee, I asked the elders, how would you find Christ? And they'll all tell you about a point in their life when they said, God, I belong to you. I accept your sacrificial atonement on the cross for my sins, and I gave Christ my life. If you want to get your life straight, if you want to follow God, If you want peace, if you want eternal life, you have to understand you can't inherit faith. You have to come to a personal decision to accept Christ. There's a second bullet point, and that is you can't earn faith. All the major religions of the world give me their... Oh yeah, Jesus said you must be born again. All the major religions of the world, uh, there they are all up there. All of them believe in salvation by works. If you've had one of those boys on the bicycles who spent two years for that other uh, uh, cult that's uh, up here in Idaho, I bet you'll, you'll ask them, how do you know you're saved? And they'll say, well, I'm, I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying to give them the offering. I go to church. I'm, it's about works. And if you look at being a Muslim and you be, being New Age, if you're involved in any of the major religions of the world, they're all trying to earn salvation. And so here comes Christianity where Jesus says, I died on the cross for your sins and all you have to do is give me your heart and life. And when you give Christ your heart and life, suddenly he changes you and you don't have to change yourself. You're already saved. Now you as a response to that salvation, you live different. And the power of a personal decision is the power of what God has in your life to change it. You can't earn faith. Some years ago, I was, um, well, one of my heroes is a guy named Chuck Chuck Colson. He was a former uh, aide to uh, Richard Nixon, and he ended up going to jail for Watergate. He was involved in obstruction of justice. And uh, he went to church. Yeah, I believe it was an Episcopalian. It was an Evangelical Episcopalian church. He gave him the money in the offering. He was involved in some of the church offices. He thought he was a good moral person. And then he was convicted of uh, obstruction of justice. And he was on his way to prison. And Senator Howard Hughes, the uh, senator from Iowa, said, Chuck, uh, you better not go by yourself to prison. You need to have Jesus in your heart. And Chuck Colson said, well, I'm not ready for that. Uh, I have a lot of doubts. And Harold Hughes handed him a copy of C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. And Chuck Colson began to read it. And after reading it, he knelt by his bed and let Christ into his life. He made a personal decision. It wasn't about church. It wasn't about earning his salvation. It wasn't about who his mom and dad were. It had everything to do with a personal decision to accept Christ. Some years ago, I had an opportunity to hear Chuck uh, Colson, and uh, he told about how he came to faith. And at the end of his talk, he said to the crowd, he said, if you haven't accepted Christ, you need to do that. You may think you're a Christian, This is a Christian nation. We all think we're Christians, he said. And then he said this. He said, uh, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than living in a garage makes you a car. you got to have a personal faith. Now, if you came to First Baptist Caldwell this morning, and we're glad you did, there's the next step. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about faith. And you need a personal faith. Not a Sunday go to meet in faith, but a faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Do you have a personal faith? Second piece of advice. You need a complete faith. That is, it can't be just partial, but you have to give them What's that word there? All? Not some, but all of your heart. Now let me explain heart. When you and I think of heart, we think of a pump. 
something you, uh, well, you get a heart bypass. I think uh, Daryl and I were talking about our former youth pastor. He had a five point uh, five by, uh, bypass. We're not talking about the pump. In the Hebrew mind, the, the heart was where a person's values and dreams and hopes and ethics, every part of their life. It's, it's, it's really, when you tell your spouse on uh, uh, Valentine's Day, I love you with all my heart, you're not talking about your ventricles. You're talking about yourself. And that's what this word is using when it's saying that you need to trust in the Lord and it needs to be with all of yourself where he changes your values and he changes how you behave and you're not the hothead you used to be and you're suddenly no longer chasing uh, women and you're in charge of your life. Christ is in charge of your life so that your will and how you make ethical decisions and what you choose for amusements and what you watch on TV and the, uh, the things you put into your body. Uh, the Lord has been convicting me about jelly donuts. I thought the joy of the Lord was your strength. It turns out it was caffeine and sugar, and I had to make some changes. Well, if you love the Lord with all your heart, as the Bible teaches, then that causes you to want to give him your complete heart. I'll give you a couple bullet points. Number one, it means you give God your life. There's not one part of your life that doesn't belong to God now. You give him everything. And everything you have and everything you hope for and everything you dream and everything part of your life and your wife and your kids and your husband and uh, how you treat everybody and how you drive and how you spend your money and what you think about and every aspect of your life is given to him. You give him your life. And secondly, it means you give him your desires. So suddenly, when I trust in the Lord with all my heart, it touches what my life is all about, what I'm trying to achieve. It touches my attitudes and actions. It touches my relationships. It touches my thought life. It touches what I'm trying to achieve in, in my life. It touches every moment of every day. You trust him with all your heart. A few years ago, um, one of our friends came to California from the Midwest. And one of the local amusement parks uh, had a new roller coaster. And uh, I'll try most everything, but uh, I don't like roller coasters. And the guy I was with, I went to seminary with, we've had kind of a rivalry over the years. And uh, he knows I don't like roller coasters. And so he said, I d deliberately he said, Platt, I want to see the new roller coaster in your, uh, your neck of the woods. And I remember having this kind of foreboding feeling as we walked up towards the line, and I wasn't going to let him know how afraid I was. And I live, I'm kind of a logical person, so um, about halfway up the line, I thought I would take a, um, a walk around the roller coaster. And I checked many of the steel beams just to see if they'd moved, and they didn't, and I was relieved. And uh, then I, uh, as I got back in line, I, I was more and more worried, and so I began tracking. I don't know if you ever do this. I watch people who got on, and I make sure that they got off. I call of fault. <laughs> yep, that, that guy, he, he made it. Okay, this is good. Okay. Well, we got closer and closer and closer, and... Um, I became more anxious. <laughs> you know, what can go wrong will go wrong, uh, Murphy's Law said. So uh, anyway, as we got closer, uh, I saw a sign, and it, it just gave me such peace. It said, if you have an incidence of heart attacks, strokes, or high blood pressure. Now, it just so happens that my doctor had prescribed me some high blood pressure medication just two weeks before. And I turned to my buddy and I said, you know, I really re was really looking forward to this. And I really wanted to, you know, but, but my doctor is telling me I can't take this. Okay, now here's the question for you. Did I have faith in the roller coaster? No, I didn't. I had every intention. I stood in line. I told everybody I was going to do it. I even checked out the information. But see, unless you get in the roller coaster, 
it really isn't faith. And folks, that happens to a lot of people with Christian faith. They grew up in a Christian home. They maybe either went to church with their wife or their spouse, their kids. They went with mom and dad. They stood in line. They went to Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night. You know, we don't smoke, we don't chew, we don't go with the girls that do, you know. And that, that's what life, they think, is about faith. But unless all of your life and all of your desires and all of yourself is put on the Lord Jesus with all your heart, you don't know God. And so if you're a young person here this morning and you've been hanging around this place and you've been getting to know Pastor Nate and uh, you've been hearing Bible stories and maybe even going to Bible studies and you're an adult, there is another step, and it's the most important step, and that's where you give him your heart. You trust him as Lord and Savior, and then you make him your Lord. That's the next step. That's what heart is about. And that's the reason most of us come to church time after time, because we're trying to become Christ followers, and every day we try to give him a little more of our heart. You need a complete faith. I'll give you a third one. You need a divine faith. A divine faith. It says, do not lean on your own understanding. There are three things about my own understanding that I know, and that's why I need God's understanding and not mine, and I can't lean on my own. The first one is that human wisdom is fickle. The Atkins diet, Atkins diet was around. It's gone. Pac-Man. Do you remember Pac-Man? For those of you who are into, uh, you guys don't know about Pac-Man, but we knew it back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there was a hula hoop. When Daryl and I were uh, in grade school, there was a hula hoop. There was a, some of you don't remember Rubik's Cube. They were all the rage at one time, but they all have gone out of style like bell bottoms and tie-dye shirts and hairstyles and certain hobbies. It's remarkable that's the way it is with human wisdom. And the remarkable thing is, if you trust in man's wisdom, it will always change. Because it's man, and he doesn't know where he's going. The second thing I know about human wisdom is it's fallible. That means it makes mistakes. It's impossible for a human being to be 100% right. And if you take human wisdom from your buddies at school, from uh, uh, teachers, from coworkers, from uh, the world, you're going to get advice that's sadly mistaken a good share of the time. Let me give you some examples. This is a quote from um, Ernest Mach. In 19, uh, uh, let's see, 1914, uh, this is what he said. I can accept the theory of relativity about as little as I can accept the existence of atoms and other such dogmas. Was he right? No. <laughs> Incidentally, he's the one, the, the, you know, Mach 1, Mach 2, that's who it's named after. He was a pretty brilliant man, but he was stupid in terms of the future. He was wrong. I'll give you another one. This is a quote from General John Sledgewick at the Battle of Spotsylvania. He said, they couldn't hit the broad side of a barn at this dist, and those are his last words on earth. <laughs> that's, a true, that's a true quote. Simon Newcomb, just about 18 months before the Wright brothers, this is what he said, flight by machines heavier than air is impractical and insignificant, if not utterly impossible. His own understanding. A Munich school teacher told uh, Albert Einstein this. He said, you'll never amount to much. Bill Gates, you know, the famous Bill Gates. I'm going to be in Seattle this afternoon. He said, 640K ought to be enough for anybody. I just not got a new computer uh, this month. It has 512 gigabytes, okay? Uh, his own understanding. Or the last one, this is a recording executive at Decca Records. This is what he said to the Beatles when he turned them down. He said, we don't like their sound. Besides, groups of guitars from England are on their way out. And that was before the Rolling Stones, the Dave Clark Five, and all the other uh, groups from England. 
If you rely on man's understanding, he's always going to be wrong. Your buddies are going to be wrong. The world's wrong. If you don't rely on God, you're going to make a fatal mistake because human wisdom is fatal. That's the third one. The Hebrew word here for um, own understanding, I'm sorry, for the word lean, is the Hebrew word sha'an. It's only used a couple of times in the Bible. It's used to support with or to lean on, and it has to do with the way someone uh, falls upon something. And the way it's used the other time in the Bible is it's used in uh, the book of 1 Samuel, and it tells how Saul fell on his sword. That's how he ended his life. He leaned on his sword, it says, and fell on it. I don't think it's any accident because Solomon knew the story. Remember, David worked for King Saul, and David must have known, and he told it to Solomon, and Solomon uses this exact word, Sha'an, to say to you, if you want to commit Harry Carry, if you want to be uh, stupid, if you want to commit suicide, start relying on yourself. A lot of people say, look to your soul for the answer. Go inside and find your inner self. Well, I've looked inside my inner self, and it's stupid, and it's full of sin. And unless I have the imputed righteousness of Christ inside of me, I'm going to always make bad decisions. And so it is no wonder, the word here is intentional, that uh, he says, don't lean on your own understanding. Several Bible verses. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end there leads to death. Another Bible verse that says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Here's how you make good decisions. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Did you read yesterday about a guy who was uh, an architect and he was on the uh, 46th story of a skyscraper down in Manhattan yesterday. I'm sorry, Friday. Friday. It was in the paper yesterday. And he was up there and he had a harness around himself while he was walking around. They're going to put a, cane, a crane on top of this building and he was the architect. The only problem is, is that the safety belt wasn't attached to anything. And on Friday in Manhattan, this man fell off the building and died. I want to tell you, folks, that's what happens when a lot of people trust in themselves and they don't have their safety belt hung on Jesus. They have it hung on their money and their finances and their family. And when their wife dies, their kids are gone. When the money is gone, when life falls apart, they have nothing that their life is anchored to. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to lean on the Lord Jesus. Fourth one, you need a growing faith. You need to, in all your ways, how you live, in everything you do, get to know Him, acknowledge Him. The Hebrew word here is yada. It's used a number of times in Scripture. It speaks of knowing God in the deepest way, knowing anybody in the deepest way. It's progressive, so it's growing. It's dynamic, so it's, uh, it's powerful, and uh, it has a way of changing you in the spiritual sense. When you put God in the center of your life, and you now make it about your life goal to know God in a deeper way, it's remarkable how God changes you. So it means two things. It means you strive to know God intellectually. That's why you go to Sunday school. I hope you go to the adult class that starts at 11 o'clock if Platt ever gets done here. Uh, you, that's why I study the Bible every day. I'm, uh, I've been in the ministry 46 years. I've read through the Bible uh, 46 years. This is my 47th year reading through the Bible. Do I learn something every day? You bet, because I want to know God with my mind. You love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength. So it's important that you read bi books about the Scriptures. You need to read books of, from people about the, uh, theology and discipleship and biographies of good Christians and be involved in good podcasts and be involved in good classes. And You need to go know God and know His Word. And that's why you read it cover to cover. I mean, just 
go off notes for a second and say, folks, if, if you're a Christian and you're not in the Bible every day, you are not in all your ways acknowledging Him. You can't know God if you're not in His Word every day. And many of us spend more time watching sports and more time watching the news. Many of us know more about what Donald Trump wore today or yesterday or what Hillary did yesterday than we do about what the Lord says in His Word. And the stories and the wisdom and the commands and the entreaties from God are important for you in all your ways to acknowledge Him. It means you know Him intimately. So you look for opportunities to pray, and you look for opportunities to grow in your prayer life, and you look for ways to practice the fruit of the Spirit. You look for ways uh, to be more yielded to God. One of my friends said to me this week, he said, last uh, year we gave uh, 23% of our income to God's work. Next year we're giving, I'm sorry, next year we're giving 24%. He says, if we're going to follow God, it means we give Him more and more. In all our ways, we progressively get to know Him. You look for ways to serve the Lord. I, I'm so thrilled with several people in your church who are involved in teaching kids and uh, being involved in ministry. That's how you know Him. And I look back to Bethel Baptist in Pasadena and remember Daryl's mom and dad and many others who served the Lord because their goal was to, in all their ways, acknowledge Him. You need to have a growing faith. Give you one last one. That is, you need a secure faith. Here's what I know to be true, and that is there is a guarantee when you follow God. And I love the guarantee. It says, and he will make your paths straight. What it means is, in Israel, there were all these crooked roads that went around all the uh, mountains and uh, hills and so on and so on. And if you uh, went around those turns, that's where the robbers were. That's where the bandits were. That's where it was dangerous. And so if you had a straight road, that's where safety was and security was. And that's what this verse is saying, is when you trust in the Lord, it's not that... uh, you won't have problems. But you'll have the security and providence and sovereignty of God to help you deal with your problems. A couple of bullet points. That means, number one, you have God's help. In all the bumps of the road, you've got the help of God. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. You'll know that He causes all things to work together for good. He will bless your life and you'll have His help in your career, in your finances, in your kids, in the hard things of life, the disappointments, if you have prostate cancer like we heard about with Mel Davis, it's remarkable to me how when you have the help of God, you can face anything, folks. But you need a secure faith. Secondly, it means, powerful thing, that you have God's direction. Boy, if I know that my life isn't a mistake, one of the reasons that I shaved off my head is because I'm, or shaved off my hair is because I'm always confused and I'm always, mm, what am I going to do here? If I've got my life, folks, I know where I'm going. I've got His help, and I know He'll guide my life and He'll direct my paths. I'll tell you a story, and then I'm done. One of my friends is a guy named Tom Bayless. He was in one of the churches that I served. I served a church in Colorado for a year. And uh, Tom became one of my buddies. And a few years ago, uh, his wife Pam, that's her on the right, she got cancer, breast cancer, and uh, she went through a really hard time, and God miraculously healed her. And they thought they were out of the woods, uh, and so life really moved along. They had grandchildren. Their kids, give me a couple slides there, couple of kids that uh, got married, their daughter had a baby, they took trips, they had a wonderful life, and Tom followed the Lord, and things were going great. And then Tom was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer. Not early stages like we heard about with Mel Davis, stage four. And he wondered what he was going to do. And he camped on this phrase, He will direct your paths. He will make your paths straight. And 
Here he was stricken with pain, and he went through all the uh, CT scans and all the chemotherapy and all the various things that they do these days, and the uncertainty of knowing whether he would make it. I talked to Tom on the phone uh, a couple years ago, and here's what he said. He said, quote, I'm not worried. Give me a click there. I'm not worried. Regardless of the outcome, I know that the Lord who knows every cell in my body also knows what tomorrow holds, and he directs my path. Friend, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need him today. Friend, if you don't know him in a personal way, a complete way, this is the day. Today is the opportunity for you to take the best advice in the world that will change your life. Here's how you do it. A personal decision, you bow your head, close your eyes, and you say before God, God, I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry for my sin, and I want Jesus to take over my life. And the words won't save you, but the attitude will, and you give your heart to Christ. Many of us in this room are already Christians, but that doesn't mean you stop at that decision. But then you, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and you are constantly turning your back on your own understanding and letting him run your life. And when you have the strength that comes from him, he will direct your paths. It's the best advice in the world. Let's pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and nobody's looking around, maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. I'm going to give you an opportunity with your heads bowed and your eyes closed to let Christ into your heart. A simple prayer that says, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. I want you to take over my life. You ask him to do that right now where you are. Head still, but eyes still closed. Nobody looking around. Maybe you're a believer this morning and... Uh, there are some ways you have not been acknowledging Him. Maybe you've neglected Bible study and prayer on a personal basis, and today's the day you say, God, I, I promise you, maybe there are areas of your life that I mentioned. This would be a great opportunity to let Christ take over more of your heart. You tell Him that right now. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity of studying your word and for these five valuable pieces of advice. We ask you to hear the prayer of each sincere person who let you into their life. I pray that you'd come in and take control, that you would empower them with your Holy Spirit and you'd change them from the inside out. And then I pray for all of us, new believers and long-term believers, that we might give you all of our heart and not lean on our own understanding, not to trust the world's wisdom, but to trust you. Father, may we acknowledge you in all of our ways and become more like you, that we might enjoy the security of the purpose and meaning in life that you give us, because we know you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus? And uh, we'll just do the choruses, Sarah. Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
to change if it's everything about our life our little bits and pieces father that we would turn our eyes upon jesus turn your eyes upon afternoon for the the all church birthday party um we had a we had a very sad day last weekend my my, my brother moved back into town from alaska and he turned 40. oh there he is uh, oh, the youth is gone no yes uh, no but he still has hair smack take that Ah, uh, but uh, God is good. It's okay. He had a much easier. I was up at camp for my 40th, and my lovely friends at camp, Jim Eisendrager, um, they got up early, and they went around the camp, and they put tombstones all over the campgrounds <laughs> and said, rip your youth, right? And, and 40 is just 20 times 2, but you can't do math, you know, all that good stuff. But love you, brother. We get a chance to uh, to join together this afternoon and encourage one another at the at the park and just hang out in fellowship and uh, just be a part of a family. Encourage one another. We're all uh, sinners loved by an amazing God, the potter's hand.
Things come on quick, right? Transitions. This young man behind us here that plays the saxophone, this is Daniel Buckles. He's been faithfully attending this church for years and diving in and helping. He's leaving this next Friday to head to college over in Oregon. So if you guys can be praying for him, this is our last Sunday with Daniel on the stage for a few weeks here. Hopefully he can get back over here quite often. But if we can just give him a thank you for his, his service. We're going to miss you. <laughs> Whom shall I fear? The God of angel armies is on our side. You hear me when I call. You are my morning star. No darkness fills the
Dr. Platt, we'd like to, or Dr. Mark, Pastor Mark, we'd like to bring you back up for our benediction. Okay, I think I got it. Oh, he's got it. Two things. Number one, if you prayed to receive Christ and you want more information about it, I'm just doing a, uh, an audible. Maybe Daryl and uh, some of you pastors would just be up front here to talk to anybody about receiving Christ. Number two, I'm going to be in the lobby in just a minute, and I'll shake your hand and uh, uh, give you a warm California greeting. Maybe you don't want that. See, that's a... <laughs> My prayer this week is the Lord would bless you and keep you. The Lord would make his face to shine upon you, that God would lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'll meet you in the lobby. Help me get there, though, okay? Thanks. 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 Thank you. Can I stand next to you? Okay, by the welcome center, so I should have said that. <laughs> Thank you. I have a good ghost ride, the Holy Ghost. He writes all my stuff. Thanks. I really enjoyed your service today. Thank you. It's really great. Uh, it's, it's the Bible. Thank you.